Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we cup the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Dan Nesasana, and it's the 28th of October 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So the All Core Devs call, uh, the first one in a few weeks actually, happened uh, yesterday or today, I should say. And we have an update thread here from Tim Biker, which of course I'll link in the YouTube description below. But someone has already done my job job for me on Twitter here. Um, Oiru Kimono, I think that's how you say that uh, that name there. But they basically summarize the call, or at least like the um, the main points of focus on the call. So one of the obviously big points were, of focus was withdrawals and... Um, as, uh, as noted here, everyone, everyone being the core devs, is fully on board for withdrawals to be included and for the release to be ASAP. Uh, and then obviously the next biggest upgrade on the list was 4844, you know, proto dank sharding. Uh, and for the first time, we heard a core dev make a prediction on the Shanghai hard fork without 4844. Marius speculated uh, end of February, uh, which is exactly, I guess, like what I've been saying as well, you know, that first half of 2023, but maybe towards late Q1, which March is basically getting into into late Q1 there, uh, end of Feb, uh, maybe you considered st still kind of like mid to late there. But yeah, I mean, it just depends, right? Like I've said it before uh, a lot of times that 4844 is being worked on, but if it's not ready in time for like the test nets, for example, as noted here as well, you know, multiple execution layer teams, including Geth, said that the amount of remaining work they have to do for 4844 is not that great, but the consensus layer teams tend to be more non-committal uh, because there's more work to do on that side for them. Uh, in any event, it was not intended to decide in or out on this call. Rather, it just confirmed the informal consensus that has emerged in recent weeks for everybody to keep working on it full speed. And maybe around end of, no end of November, it will all be clear whether it will be ready in time to catch the train to Shanghai when it starts to leave the station in January. So I guess in January, we're expecting... Shanghai test nets, and if 4844 isn't ready by then, it's probably not going to end up in Shanghai. We'll probably just end up having withdrawals and maybe a few other EIPs, but probably not 4844. So I, I'm still hopeful. I'm still hopeful that we can get there in, uh, in, in time for January, but it is a bit difficult to tell because obviously December and in January are, are holiday periods. We don't know who's going to be on deck and who's not during that time, and we shouldn't expect them you know, the core devs to be on deck during the holiday period. Anyway, they've got families they want to spend time with and all that stuff. But generally, yeah, if 4844 isn't ready by uh, January, it's not going into a test net. And as was noted here, we'll probably know by end of November anyway, because the core devs will have a good idea of whether they can get it ready in time uh, for those test nets that are going live. But withdrawals, definitely 100% going to be in Shanghai. Uh, obviously, every core dev wants that to happen, and everyone in the community wants that to happen. It is the next big milestone besides 4844 on the Ethereum roadmap. And it's funny that I say that because some other communities will make fun of Ethereum saying, you know, withdrawals should have been with staking from day one. But in the context of how Ethereum's proof of stake rollout has gone, uh, there's a very good reason withdrawals weren't there from day one, right? I mean, we started off with just a standalone beacon chain network that was a one-way bridge. You weren't able to withdraw from that because it was a separate network. Uh, and then we merged and we wanted to keep that as simple as possible. We didn't want to introduce anything that could break the merge. And obviously that was a good decision because we had a pretty perfect merge, right? Uh, and now shortly after the merge, we are getting withdrawals in. And, you know, at the end of the day, no one's forced to stake. And everyone knows, like when you go through the staking process uh, as, as a solo staker um, and, you know, actually sending ETH to the deposit contract, you are warned that you're, you aren't able to withdraw. And even with the LSDs, uh, I think a lot of them... Uh, warn you and say that you won't be able to actually withdraw from the uh, the bigger chain itself. You have to actually... Um, we sell it on secondary market and you may not get the exact value. As we've seen previously, these LSD tokens can quote unquote depeg from their you know true value. And and I think people are, are understand that. So uh, and the people who are staking with exchanges, as I said, they have ways to exit. They can go through CBE or I mean STE. Obviously, Lido is not an exchange, but they've got ways to exit there. But in terms of solo stakers withdrawing, uh, that just can't happen, right? Uh, right now, and obviously that'll happen in in a few months. Um, and on top of that, as well, the block awards are not withdrawable either. Uh, the only rewards that are withdrawable are the MEV uh, rewards and the fee revenue. Um, because those are execution layer rewards, but anything happening on the consensus layer, such as rewards for attesting, proposing blocks, and being a part of a sync committee, that is going to be available when beacon chain withdrawals are enabled, as well as being able to withdraw that 32 ETH per validator principle that you have, uh, if you have a validator spun up. And that brings to us to another concern that people will often bring up is that, oh, you know, when withdrawals are enabled, how many people are actually going to withdraw ETH, you know, unstake ETH and sell it? 
Well, I, I think... I've said this before on the refill, but just to refresh here, I think we can be relatively certain that at least the rewards, like not the principal, not, not the 32 ETH principal, but all the rewards uh, that have um, been accrued to this point, or at least most of them that have been accrued till this point, I think maybe 50% of them, are, uh, at, you know, around 50% will probably be sold off for tax purposes because uh, staking is taxable as income in a lot of places. And obviously you haven't been able to uh, get your ETH out to sell it to cover that tax. So maybe people have covered it on their own or haven't reported it yet, but they're going to have to pay that tax. So I can I, I can have fair, fair certainty that around 50% of, uh, uh, of most of the rewards that have been accrued to date will probably be sold maybe anywhere from 30 to 50 percent um you know it, it's kind of hard to tell but there is going to be some portion now that's on the reward side of things what about the principal well i think it really depends what the price of eth is because if eth is the price it is now and when and the, and the deposit contract went live when eth was around five six hundred dollars you know, how many people are actually going to be wanting to take profits at that point? You're just up over 2x on your ETH. You know, if you've been in it for this long, are you just, are you just going to sell when the price is, you know, at the price that it is now? I, I don't know. I don't think many people are going to do that. And we've seen tons of people entering staking over the last year or so. Uh, and how many of them are going to sell? I mean, a lot of them are probably underwater at this point. Are they going to sell? I don't know. It's 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 very hard to tell. There's a lot of speculation that goes into this, but I think that uh, I, I think that's going to be a, a quite a, a fun event to see because people are going to assume that any ETH withdrawn from staking is going to be sold, and I don't think that's the case. As I've discussed before, I expect us to have this great reshuffling event where basically there's going to be ETH actually withdrawn from centralized exchanges and LSDs and put into maybe, you know, decentralized providers like Rockapool and Stakewise V3 uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, uh, solo staking, right? So we're going to have to see, it's going to take months to play out because of the, the, the exit queue as well. I mean, you can't just like, not all the ETH can just exit at once. There's a, there's a queue and obviously that queue varies depending on how many validators are, are, are staking. Uh, so how many validators are online, I should say. Uh, but it, n nonetheless, it's going to be very interesting. I'm looking forward to withdrawals, even though it seems like such a minor upgrade, I think. If you really dig into it, it's a huge upgrade. It has huge implications for the network, uh, and not just on the, I guess, pr um, uh, uh, speculative side of things, but also on the censorship side of things too, as I've been discussing a lot lately, where I think that withdrawals are going to help with that. And, you know, to play devil's advocate, it could also make it worse. It could, you know, people could uh, say, oh, well, screw solo staking. Uh, I'm going to just put my ETH in Coinbase or Binance or, or another centralized uh, provider and stake with them. I don't really think that's going to be the case. I haven't seen any solo stakers. Or I haven't talked to any solo stakers that have ever even like alluded or hinted at that. So I don't think that's going to be the case. But at the same time, we don't we can't know for sure until withdrawals actually happens. But thankfully, withdrawals are coming. Uh, you know, mid to late Q1, maybe pushing into Q2. Uh, but they're definitely coming as part of the Shanghai upgrade. 48.44 jury's still out, but we'll know more I guess towards the end of November. Uh, and I'll keep you guys updated on that one. All right, so a big piece of news out of Google uh, over the last 24 hours. So Google Cloud has announced blockchain node services starting with Ethereum. So basically you can spin up an Ethereum node with relative ease using Google Cloud, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, I think, you know, some people would say that this is just further centralizing Ethereum, but I don't actually agree with that. I think it makes it uh, more decentralized because right now a lot of people are running uh, Ethereum nodes on AWS, for example. Now, Google Cloud is just another player in the game, which means by definition, it's making it more decentralized because people have more options and more places to to stake. Uh, Google Cloud does not run on AWS, as far as I know. Uh, it's there. It's Google's own servers, uh, and Google and Amazon are separate companies. So. By the very definition, that's more decentralized than just people running their um, their nodes on AWS or, or Amazon. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and the blog has a good coverage of this that you can check out in the YouTube description below. But speaking of nodes and node distribution, uh, there is a couple of websites you can go to. So there's NodeWatch that I've highlighted before, .io, which tracks consensus layer uh, nodes. Um, but like because consensus layer and execution layer nodes both need to be run to have a full Ethereum node. Uh, you can have relative confidence that they're uh, that they're around the same here. And and I'll bring up ethernodes.org uh, dot as well because this tracks execution layer nodes. So there's about eight thousand on ethernodes uh, of of full Ethereum nodes. That's including obviously the consensus and execution layer clients. Uh, and then you can see here there's thirteen thousand six hundred on NodeWatch, but that is not synced. So you can see there's only a, a percentage that is synced which is 66%. Now, if I do my quick math here, it should get us to around the same number. 
8,976. Yeah, so it's off by around 900 as opposed to ethernodes.org. Uh, but these numbers are only, uh, I guess, like best guesses or guesstimates. They're not totally accurate. They're not going to show 100% view of the network. Uh, they're definitely only estimates. But let's just take ethernodes.org at 8,000 here. So we can see that Geth is uh, obviously a large part of that, so 80% of it. And then you've got the other ones, Aragon, Nethermind, Beisu, which are minority clients, uh, which are uh, less there. Then, you know, we're not interested in client diversity for the sake of what I'm talking about here. We're interested in where these nodes are actually hosted. Now, I don't believe ethernodes.org has that. They have the country uh, a kind of a metric here, which shows you where which countries they're hosted in. So 45% are in the United States, 12% in Germany, 5% in Singapore, and so on and so forth. Whereas NodeWatch does. So NodeWatch will show you uh, where these are, uh, if these are hosted or unhosted nodes. And I believe, where is where is uh, hosted? Uh, here we go. So percentage of hosted nodes and percentage of non-hosted nodes. So there's 26 percent hosted and 74 percent non-hosted. Again, take these numbers with a grain of salt. I've seen them higher from other estimates. I think the highest I may have seen them is like 40% or maybe even 50%. Uh, and hosted just means on one of these services such as Google Cloud or AWS, right? But still, like, uh, there's a few. There's a, there's actually two major things to consider here. One, uh, I don't think people using these hosting services for nodes actually is a big deal. I don't think it like has a huge influence on the decentralization of the network because for example, if 50%, let's just say 50% of full nodes was hosted on AWS and Amazon said one day, well, screw you guys, we're kicking you off, right? And then 50% of full nodes on the Ethereum network would be kicked off. Well, that, does that prevent anyone from spinning up their full node on their own hardware? No, and you can do that because Ethereum has prioritized uh, the ease of spinning up a full node on consumer hardware. That's the whole point of why Ethereum is so limited at, at, at the base layer. So I don't think it's a huge deal. And uh, I think people making it out to be a huge deal uh, aren't looking at the nuance here. But also on, on top of that, I think that uh, when looking at the different services that are available, they're also based in different countries. Uh, there isn't just like AWS and Google Cloud, but there are a bunch of other hosting services that you can use as well. Obviously, you know, given that a lot of nodes are hosted in the United States, a lot of them are going to be hosted on AWS and, and, and potentially Google Cloud as well, or any other US-based cloud providers. But again, it goes back to my argument where I said that even if 50% were shut down, uh, it doesn't really matter because you could just resync your full node using the other 50% of the network on your consumer hardware. Hardware. And you could even go with even more crazy numbers. You could say that even if 90% of full nodes were, were offline, it wouldn't even be a, a, that big of a deal. Obviously, you know, the higher you go, the more impact it has. But generally, I think that it's overblown because it's not like a validator, right? It's not like where, for example, if Amazon wanted to, they could take control of all the validators list, uh, that are hosted on AWS and actually have influence on the network. A full node, uh, it, you know, is really just there for you to verify the state of the network yourself and to obviously relay your transactions uh, and use your node as an RPC, for example. But it doesn't actually have uh, validator. Uh, it's not a validator, right? It's not the same thing. It doesn't have influence to attest and propose blocks. Whereas, for example, if um, AWS hosted you know, what, what, whatever it is, so 67%, if you want to go in the extreme case of validators, which it doesn't, but let's go to the extreme case. Uh, it doesn't even have anywhere close to that. It, Amazon could take those over and then uh, basically take over the entire Ethereum network. But I don't think that people are going to do that because of the fact uh, of the matter is that running a validator is more intensive. It probably, especially if you're running that many validators on there, and there are uh, there are definitely incentives not to do that because you could, you know, as I said, like if you if Amazon had that much of the, um, the 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 network, they could in theory take over the network. But they're only taking over the network on the technical side of things. The community could still fork them out. So you could imagine it'd be messy. And I'm getting into like really um, weird territory right now. But it would get messy. But you could imagine an event where all those validators were hosted on on AWS. They get slashed right because the community comes together and says, hey, like that's it's not the real chain. This is the real Ethereum chain. Uh, and the ecosystem maybe goes with that, but it would be extremely messy because that, those 67% of validators on and AWS obviously belong to a lot of different people. There'd be a lot of ETH lost. It'd be really bad. And that's why it's encouraged not to have these validators on, on any of these, you know, services and centralize around them. But uh, but yeah, anyway, that's a few tangents there, but great to see that Google Cloud is supporting uh, Ethereum as its first blockchain node service here. 
All right, so speaking of decentralizing Ethereum staking, uh, Stakewise V3 or Stakewise put out a blog post around uh, the migration to Stakewise V3. And as I say, inside you will find the full scope of changes that are coming to the, exi to the existing product as we transition to Stakewise V3. Now you can check out this blog post. It's about an eight minute read, but it basically, as I said, describes the transition from Stakewise V2 to V3. Now, the reason why I, I, I highlight this is because Stakewise V3, as I explained a few weeks ago, is trying to become more like a rocker pool and less like a Lido, for example, right? They're trying to be more decentralized, basically. Uh, and they're going to be taking advantage of DVT or distributed validated technology. Um, from, from, what I, uh, from what I know, uh, yeah, here we go. You, you got it here. So Stakewise V2 currently acts as a, as, as like this, right? There is a Stakewise pool. It goes to a bunch of different operators. In Stakewise V3, there is going to be a Genesis vault and then there are going to be public operators uh, with obol or ssv for dvt no collateral slashing uh, cover and uh, these are going to be different vaults, right? And the vaults are going to have different scores. So there'll be risk scores, scores attached to them. So very, very cool. Uh, you can read the full uh, blog post. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. I, I recommend reading it because it's just great to see that another staking provider is making moves towards being more decentralized. All right, so Consensus has announced the launch of the MetaMask Grants DAO today, which is an employee-led consensus fund and program, program that issues grants to the developers building impactful experience within the MetaMask ecosystem. Now, for those of you who don't, who don't know, Consensus actually owns MetaMask as a, I mean, as an app, basically. It came out of Consensus. It's been with Consensus since day one, and they still own it, uh, and they still fund it and, and everything like that, obviously. Now, uh, you can build uh, with these grants. Uh, basically, you'll be able to get involved uh, if you're a developer, if you want to build something in the MetaMask ecosystem. And uh, there'll be, I think, uh, six hundred thousand dollars per quarter up for grabs. That's a huge. Act I hadn't read that yet. That's actually a huge allocation uh, for just MetaMask grants, right? That's uh, two point four million dollars. If I'm doing my math correctly, uh, a year there uh, for to fund meaningful projects. So yeah, if you are interested in building something in the MetaMask ecosystem, this is an absolute amazing opportunity honestly that's a lot of money as i said like i didn't expect it to be that high usually these grants programs are quite small but uh i, I guess like consensus recently raised as well so they've got some money to to splash around here and obviously metamask is incredibly important to the uh, ethereum ecosystem and actually beyond the ethereum ecosystem as well because metamask powers all the evm uh, change you can use all of them you can change your network you know we've all done that uh before but yeah very very cool to see such a large uh, amount of money allocated to this so yeah go check out this uh, blog post for a breakdown of what this is and how you can get involved uh it's one for the developers out there all right, a couple of Optimism updates to get through. Uh, Quicks, the Optimism NFT marketplace, has announced that they've teamed up with Layer 3 to launch an NFT bridging quest and reward users for bridging the ETH, their ETH NFTs to Optimism. Now, I remember I spoke about this a little while ago that uh, Quicks now has a bridge, so you can bridge your Ethereum Layer 1 NFTs to Optimism in order to take advantage of those cheaper fees and faster transactions. Well, now they've teamed up with Layer 3 to uh, make this much easier for, for you. So you can see here that Users who bridge an NFT can earn up to 400 XP on layer three, and those who bridge an NFT from one of our pre approved collection will receive an additional 25 OP tokens per NFT bridged from that collection. Uh, and you can see the full list of pre approved collections at this. Um at this kind of a notion site here. Now I'm loading it up. Uh, I, it, it's going to, it, it, the, the quicks picks are things like uh, crypto covens, chain runners, uh, robotos, pudgy penguins, and a few others there. Uh, some trending on Ethereum as well. Um, and, and a bunch of others as well here. So, uh, these are the pre-approved collections right now. I, I assume that's going to keep growing, but yeah, if you're really into NFTs and, uh, you want to try this out, definitely do so. I'll link it in the YouTube description below for you to check out. Uh, and the second uh, Optimism update is that Optimism has launched an OP Craft Creator Contest. So you can create content around, build structures in, and hack in, on OP Craft for up to 31,000 in OP bounties. Now, I talked about OP Craft last week or the week before. That's that game running on a... OP stack chain, fully on chain. It's basically a Minecraft clone and I played around with it on the refill. I'm sure you guys remember it. Uh, but yeah, this is really cool. So for more info on this, including submission instructions, uh, it can be found at the OP craft dash contest channel on the Optimism Discord, which you can join here with the link that I'll link in the YouTube description below. But yeah, just more OP tokens up for grabs. If you've been involved with OP craft lately, you've been playing it a lot more than I have probably, then definitely go check these out to potentially earn some rewards here. 
All right, so Uniswap Labs has posted a blog post all around all about Uniswap V3 TWAP oracles in a proof of stake world. Now, I've talked about TWAP oracles before on the refuel. TWAP basically stands for Time Weighted Average Price. And the reason why Uniswap V3 is such a great uh, TWAP oracle is because it is fully on chain. There's no need to rely on any external data. You basically just take the price of say ETH uh, from uh, Uniswap using the pools there, you average it out over time as TWAP suggests, and then that's the Oracle price that gets fed into whatever you want to feed it into. Now with the advent of proof of stake on Ethereum, uh, with the merge, this has become uh, not very secure uh, because of the fact that uh, all the risk of uh, the implications of multi-block MEV uh, why, and, and other such attacks. Now a refresher here for those who don't remember, with Ethereum proof of stake, the um, the next proposer for basically the entire uh, epic is known. Uh, for for sorry, each proposer for the entire epic uh, is known, which basically means you know which uh, validator is going to propose a block ahead of time. Now, because of this, it leads itself to what's called multi-block MEV, where basically if you know that you're going to propose uh, these blocks, you can do some funky stuff around MEV and maximize your your um your, uh, I guess, like uh, profits from that. And that could have uh, uh, um, risks for uh, TWAP oracles because you could potentially manipulate them if you were able to control various transactions within blocks if you knew that you were going to be a proposer. Now, there are obviously solutions for this coming down the pipeline like uh, SSLE, which I've talked about before. Um, a lot on the refill actually. And I think I went through it last week or the week before Vitalik had a blog post about it. Uh, but yeah, Unisop Labs has put out their own blog post on this explaining all of this and more. And it's quite lengthy actually. Uh, I, I, I managed to skim through it today. I haven't read it just yet, but I highly recommend giving it a read if you're interested in learning about this stuff. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, a tweet from Vitalik here that I wanted to talk a little bit about where he says, my concern with VR is similar to some anti-crypto people's concerns about crypto, a feeling that people are, quote, in love with the idea of it, end quote, in a way that far outpaces actual applications. Just like with crypto, I do think important apps exist, but VR for the sake of VR won't work. Now, I want to say I, I, I kind of like agree with Vitalik here and disagree with him. So I agree with him on the part of there is definitely a feeling within, I think, the crypto community in general that they're in love with the idea of crypto. They're in love with what crypto can enable and, what, and, and the benefits and positivity that crypto can bring to the world. But... The, the fact of the matter is up until this point, a lot of the activity within crypto, if not most of it, has been speculative, casino games, Ponzi's, you know, there hasn't, like, if you look at the amount of value generated, uh, it's basically come from from that those things. And those things aren't necessarily bad, but if you're in love with the idea of crypto, like I am, to be like a decentralization maximalist and to, you know, better people's lives and to enable more freedom for people, and you look at those sorts of things, especially during bull markets, you kind of look at it and like, what are we even doing sometimes? Right? I'm sure you've all had this feeling during a bull market. You look at it and you look at all this stupidity and you're like, what are we even doing here, right? And I think Vitalik's drawing a parallel here with, with VR uh, is that it's it's very similar to cryptos where people have this utopian vision of VR where we're all going to be living in uh, this VR world that uh, that is perfect and everything's sorted out for us and, and we're having a fun, a lots of fun in it uh, and everything's you know great. Whereas I don't think that's actually going to be the case personally. Um, I don't think that VR is going to be like this uh, utopia. I actually think VR is just going to be like the internet is today, except in a virtual world, right? The internet is a quote unquote virtual world, but it's not one that we really interact with like we do with VR. Now, I'm not saying that VR games uh, are bad or anything like that. I've played plenty of them before and I, I love them, but I'm talking about very specifically the idea of a VR you know, world, like an MMO, for example. Where it's basically free for all. Basically, the idea of Ready Player One, if you've seen that movie or read the book, right? So, that, like, if I look at the internet and just like transpile that to VR, <laughs> I feel like we're just going to like recreate the internet in VR and it's actually not going to be that fun for people because it's just going to be the same bullshit we have on the internet in VR and it's not going to be that utopia that people want it to be. Um, and then things like questions of like, you know, who moderates the VR world? Like, is it just a free-for-all? Can anyone just do anything they want in the VR world? Can they say whatever they want? Can they harass whoever they want? You can imagine this, like if you want to create the, recreate the real world in VR, but just like add things like, uh, like, you know, space travel and flying cars and all the stuff that we don't have in real life, 
Okay, that's fine. But what about the social side of it? Can I, as a person in VR, go up to someone and just constantly stalk them, right? And constantly harass them and annoy them with no moderation, with no one stopping me from doing that? Uh, is there going to be like a police department in, uh, you know, in, in the VR world? Is there going to be a... Um, a law, uh, 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 laws and, and are there going to be representatives that uh, run the world, so to speak? Or is it all just going to be run in code? Like, I don't know what that's actually going to look like. Obviously, there are companies like Meta, uh, which is uh, Facebook, taking big bets on, on this vision. But you know, that's still going to be, there's still going to be a lot of control there. So I think it's just going to end up looking like the current internet in, in the way it kind of works. Um, but where I kind of disagree with Vitalik a little bit here is that the parallels... They they make sense, but not in the same not 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 totally right. I think that crypto it, it tends to attract a very specific set of people, at least the people who stick around, not just the people who come for bull markets, but the people who are in it for that idea of crypto. I think those people are definitely on the on the most end anti government or at least anti big government. Um, they're definitely obviously freedom maximalist. They're definitely, uh, people who are, you know, really care about decentralization and care about things like credible neutrality. Whereas with VR, I don't think there's a lot of people like that. I think, uh, I don't think there's really any people like that. I think with VR, it's people just wanting to escape reality. Uh, whereas people in crypto want to make reality better by providing better tools to people. But if you want this VR utopia where you're living in a virtual world and, and you believe it's going to be awesome because you can escape reality, well, I don't think it's going to end up like that. Uh, I, and, and I think that video games in general have actually trended towards uh, uh, going away from that vision, especially with things like uh, pay to win and in-app purchases. It's just making people feel like they're not escaping reality as they, they used to be. And I get that, like I'm take, I'm, I'm painting the uh, maybe the cynical view of things here, but I think that if we're not careful, that's how it's going to end up. And I don't think a decentralized, like a fully decentralized free for all VR world would actually work very well because it, the, uh, for all the problems I just mentioned, plus all the ones I haven't mentioned, there has to be some kind of moderation and some kind of rules baked in. Now, can those rules be fully baked in within code? I don't believe so because there are certain things you can't just bake into code. And then, and then, okay, if it's decentralized, there's code running it, and, and people are running the code. Like, okay, well, what what if you want to change something? Does is it go? Does it go through a governance process like what we go through with Ethereum? Uh, and then, what if people object to that? You know, how much power do people have uh, to change things within the game? Does the game start, oh, sorry, the VR world. Does the VR world start blurring with the real world in that you do stuff in VR, you earn money, uh, and then you can use, uh, you, know, you know, you earn money in the real world and vice versa. Uh, there's all these questions, there's all these things. And, you know, I, I would love to live in, a, in in kind of like a virtual uh, world where everything was, was dandy and everything was fine, but I don't think that's the way it's going to play out. Um, but yeah, anyway, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it, actually, if, if you want to say it in the YouTube comments on the um, Daily Gray Discord channel because this is something that I've thought about quite a bit because as you guys know, I, I've, I've been a massive gamer uh, up until pretty much I got into Ethereum. I was a pretty big gamer and I loved the escapism of it. But these days, a lot of gaming feels like a chore, to be honest. And from everything that I've seen of VR worlds uh, as they exist today and, and, and just like the logical con conclusion of them, I don't think they're going to be the utopia people want them to be. Just like how crypto is not the utopia that we all are like we all uh, think it's going to be or we're in love with the idea of it. A lot of crypto is shit, right? A lot of crypto is just re scams and Ponzi's and stuff that we don't want to see. But that's what comes with, uh, I guess, like the free-for-all territory of decentralization, incredible neutrality. You can't have the good without the bad. And, you know, unfortunately, the bad right now, or at least in bull markets, is more pronounced than the good. But over a long enough time frame, I think the good will outweigh the bad. But again, that's me being in love with the idea of crypto. Uh, and that's not reality just yet. But I, I'm, I, I do think that it's going to be reality eventually, but it's just not it today. But anyway, I'm going to end it on that note. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone.